Good morning, good morning. Um, wow, I'm a bit nervous being here. I mean, I'm not used to speaking to a lot of people, so, uh, so forgive me. They, they actually gave me some good advice. They said, picture the guys in their underwear and you'll be fine. It's not working. I saw a guy coming in with pink underwear. Don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> so anyway, my name is Mike Cook. I'm the managing director and co-founder of Cybernetic Walrus. And uh, I brought one of my colleagues with me and I'm gonna let him pronounce his name. So my name is Saboj Cismadia and I'm a technical artist on the game. Yeah, we brought him in from Hungary, so that's why I can't pronounce his name. Anyway, welcome to Racing Ahead with Unity. Um, it's about anti-graviator, a game by Cybernetic Walrus, which is we. Now, if you're looking for a deep technical dive into Unity, then I'm sorry, but you are in the wrong room. Right? We're not going to go deep into it, but we're going to show you like, what, what of the tools we use in Unity 2017 to actually make our game. Um, who was at the training day? All right. And who was at the keynote? All right. Everybody almost. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so Cybernetic Walrus is, a, as I said, as a Belgian company. We are four people. Uh, we have two programmers. One is me. Uh, one is called Peter, we left him at home. And then we have uh, Sabi, see how I pronounce his name, a little bit shorter so it's easier. And we have a guy called Dovidas, which I call Dovi, because that's also easier. And um, yeah, we are the four people making, making Anti-Graviator. Now, there's also a bit of a story behind, um, behind this. And, and, and this is one of the slides that's, that's a very important one uh, for me, and I also want, are, are there people in the room that are not making games at the moment but are thinking about it and making a career switch? Is there anybody like that? Yeah, maybe, okay, good. So for, especially for you, this talk is especially for you. Uh, no, this, this goes on to everybody. So the story of my life, I'm 41 years old, three years ago I decided to Stop with everything I was doing and start my own, no, I didn't want to start my, I wanted to start my own company, but I went back to school. I wanted to get a degree in game development, and that's basically what I have done. And the reason I'm showing this slide, I only found out afterwards, uh, was that I was actually staying in a comfort zone, and I didn't want to get out of it. And I always wanted to make games, I always wanted to do things, but I worked a bit for Microsoft, and I had a good job, and I, I drove a nice BMW company car, and I had all of these things, but I also had a problem, getting out of bed in the morning because I didn't like what I was doing. So it, it was really hard for me to keep doing what I was doing, and, and I had a choice, you know. Either I would continue in, in doing the same thing, um, doing the same job, maybe for a different company, but I thought, no, that's not what my life has to be about. I mean, you only live once, right? So I stepped out of the comfort zone, and, and that's where the magic happens, you know? So I started an education, went back to school, met three very talented young guys um, who got stuck with a grandpa like me. Um, so, and, and, and we started making games, and, and that's the story. So, um, yeah, so that's how Anti-Graviator came about. It's, uh, it's a student game. We started out, it started out as a student game, but we, uh, we actually took it into our own company. So in January of this year, we actually formed a company called Cybernetic Walrus. Um, we got the IP, which belonged to the school, because that's how things work when you produce something dur during your school period. So the IP is ours now. Uh, the company is ours now. And, and we're developing this. And we are planning this for Steam, Xbox One, and PS4 as well. Um, that's something we're not too sure about. but so. I hope some of you have seen the game. Um, Anti-Graviator is a, is a racing game. It's a futuristic ra racing game. And it's also inspired by the two games I'm showing right now. Um, well, why, are, why is it inspired by? Well, we didn't plan on making a racing game. We, well, we planned on making a racing game, but not a futuristic racing game. That wasn't the idea in the beginning. Um, we actually planned to make a game where one person would be racing and the other person would be triggering traps on that player and he would have to avoid it and then you would switch and so on and so on. That didn't work. So we just scratched that idea and we, um, we thought, yeah, let's, let's have both players race. And then 
we thought, yeah, let's make it futuristic because if we make it futuristic, we can build a lot of props easily, we can reuse a lot of parts, um, and that's how it became futuristic. And then some people said, hey, this looks like Wipeout. And we're like, what? Oh, Wipeout. Yeah, yeah, we know that one, and it looks like F0. And some say it looks like Podracer. And because of the trap uh, system, some say it looks like Split Second. So there's a lot of games that have been an inspiration to what we have been, been doing. So we had to start like, what are we going to do? How, how does this game need to look? So we looked at some early reference. OK, so we gathered some reference. That's what I, if you make a game, what you should do. Uh, find reference about the things you want to do. So we looked at planes. We looked at boats. We looked at how things go fast. Um, we looked at turrets and how things get destructed and how we can use traps. Uh, but we also looked at the environment. like. How do these tracks go? It's an anti-gravity game. So you need loops, you need corkscrews, you need all of these things. And that's what we didn't have in the beginning. Uh, and that's what makes it a pain to make because, yeah, it's not that. Um, well, the, the problem with gravity is that it, it, it plays a role, right? So gravity pushes you down. And um, that's hard if you go upside down because then you tend to fall off. So we had to find, we had to find solutions for that. We also thought about what are we going to do with the, with the lighting of the game? How are we going to, how are we going to make that look? So again, looked at some reference of, uh, of how we, we would put these things um, in the game. We also looked at one thing and that was the Atom demo. The reason why I'm telling this is because the school we, uh, we went to, um, it's a school called Ho West, uh, it's in Belgium, and it's actually selected by the Rookies, which is a competition that Autodesk organizes for students as the number one school in the world when it comes to next-gen gaming. So yay to us, we've studied there, right? And uh, we all actually also graduated with honors or high honors, so that must mean something, I hope. Um, but anyway, one of the problems in our school is that most of the art is being taught in a different engine. I'm not gonna, know, uh, gonna say the name here, but you probably know what I'm talking about. And uh, a lot of the programming stuff is done in Unity. So when we started making this game, you know, there was this discussion about, are we gonna use that one engine, which name I'm not gonna use, but there's a fourth edition of it, or are we gonna use Unity? And our artist said, like, no, let's use the other one. And I said, no, no let's use this one, but we can't do what they do. And, and I said, wait, we can. There's a demo, it's called the Atom demo. Take a look at it. I mean, if they can make something realistic like this, then we should be able to do it as well, right? So and that's what they start doing. So they, they start looking at it. And um, what we got when we, when we posted some early screenshots, and this was basically back in February of this year, because before we didn't really get the whole PBR lightning uh, like, we, like we would have wanted to have. Um, and that's what we got. Oh, the name is there. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's what, what people started to, uh, to say, like, are you, are you guys using that other engine? And you can see that's also something I would like to point out in this slide, that our school, even though I graduated as a developer and he graduated as an artist, the first year is like a global year where also the developers have to learn a little bit about art. And you can see my art skills right there. I blackened the icon um, and I made like the strip in black over the name of the person that asked this question. So there you go. I can do art, right? Um, so uh, that's anyway, that was a question we, we got like a lot. And that's when we started to talk to Unity and say like, look, maybe we can, you know, do some cross promotion. Like you guys can talk about our game and we can talk about how, how cool your engine is and how you can actually do the things that you can do with this other engine, but not a lot of people know uh, how to do it. Anyway, just to come bit, a bit back to the game, right? Um, we also have some differentiators in the game. Because when you're making a game, you don't want to make a copy of, of the games that already exist. So what have we done differently? We impl implement a trap, so that's the kind of the split second thing. So you can activate traps, as you can see, there's like boulders flying around. Um, we have drops and splits, 
So some of the games have that. Now, why do we want to use splits? I think giving a player a decision in a game is always a fun thing to do. Should I go left or right? It's an easy decision, but you still have to make it. And when things go fast, it makes it pleasant. But we also have split screen on PC, which is something a lot of games don't have nowadays. Uh, we can go up to four players in split screen. And we have vehicle customization. When we're looking at the games that are out there now, the, the bigger names, they usually have an array of different chips. And we thought, like, no, let's make it a bit different. Let's make sure that we, um, we can actually interchange parts on our ship and that you can actually tweak uh, the ship like that. So you can change skins. And for the people attending, uh, we actually made a Unity skin. If you went to the, uh, um, the keynote yesterday, you probably have seen them importing like uh, one of the, well, our ship actually from, uh, from Autodesk, from Maya into, into Unity and back and so on. So, and they use the skin we made specifically for Unity and we still have a couple of those uh, vouchers which will allow you to unlock them in the game once we release. So if you come by our boot, you can get one of those if you want. Uh, we have a boot that I made with Unity uh, uh, set up downstairs in the expo hall. Now, one of the things we also, what's also important is teamwork, of course, right? And um, we started out using a mercurial kind of Git system, Git, well, thing to push like changes and get everybody working. Um, but we had a problem. It became small very soon because a lot of the art we use, uh, we also pushed it along with it and it became big. And, um, and, and we ran out of size fast. So we were looking at a solution either to keep what we have and then start paying for an online solution. But at the time, Unity actually uh, released uh, Collaborate. Okay, so that's, that's like, I don't know, uh, well, a year ago almost. Um, and, and with Collaborate, I mean, it's built into Unity. So we thought, yeah, let's, let's give that a try. So we don't need like another app to, to get those changes on. And even for our, for our artists, that, that's even a confusing app to use, usually, those external things, because they get lost in like all of the branching and whatever. And well, with Collaborate, we, we could be it's a bit simpler, but we could do what we want. Now, the only problem is we kind of started using it in 5.6. And when Collaborate started up in 5.6, it took a while before it, uh, before it actually got responsive. So we're very happy that Unity added this. OK, so it now says, hold on. <laughs> so we're always holding on for, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, it, 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 it helps. OK, on to the visual part, because that's one of the most important things of our games is, is how we do things visual. Um, and one of the most important things is the post-processing stack. So you've probably, if you've been to the keynote, you saw a bit of it yesterday. They explained it a little bit. Um, and that's what actually makes this scene pop, right? It's the post-processing. Because if I turn it off, then I have this. If I turn it on, then I have this, right? So that's a, oh, no, that's too far. Um, so that's a huge difference, right? So um, we actually use post-processing version one. There's now a version two of it, uh, which has uh, post-processing volumes. Now, if you're on a project that uses post-processing volumes one, then there is a post-processing volume asset that we created to have post-processing volumes. So volumes means that you can actually blend between two different post-processing settings. And that's for us is important if you, for instance, go through a tunnel Right? If you have bright sunlight outside and you go through a tunnel, um, the light will darken it already, but you can like, give it that, that extra feel, like maybe make it a bit cold and, and put some blue lighting in there. And uh, I'm going to have Subi talk about that in a second. So that's basically how we got famous, because during the keynote in, uh, in Amsterdam, that's the first time they, mess they, uh, they talked about us. Well, they didn't talk about us. They were actually looking for the post-processing stack to put it on something else, and we saw our name popping up, so we were proud. Uh, yeah. All right, anyway, I'll, I'll let Subi do, uh, Scooby do, Subi do. So right. I'm just quickly gonna show what we use in the game from the post-processing stack. 
So the first thing is ambient occlusion. It uh, creates a really cool uh, contact shadow which, which adds a cool depth to the scene, as you can see, as I'm turning it on and off, especially here. Uh, screen space reflections, we don't always use it because the, gr the game is really fast, so you don't really see if the reflections are accurate or not, so it's not really necessary and it's better for the performance. And then depth of field is another thing we don't really use. It's, again, it's not really necessary for us. The motion blur, I personally don't really like motion blur in other games, but uh, because of the speed of the game, it really helps to yeah, make it even faster. And as Mike already said, we use the post-processing volume to blend between profiles, so we don't really need adaptation. And this way we have more control over what we want to do. And bloom, bloom is really important for us because we use a lot of uh, emissive materials, as you can see on the top here and the sides. It's really, it really helps with the overall look of the game. And then color grading is one of the most important things in post-processing stack. It creates the whole feel of the scene and it's different for every scene, so there is no recipe for it. You just gotta do what you want and how you want. And then chromatic aberration and grain is something very subtle. You don't necessarily notice it, but it's something in the back of your mind, so it really helps with selling the, the whole thing. And uh, since the game is really fast, people are mostly focusing on the ship and the track in front of the ship, so vignette is helping guiding the, the view of the player to, to this point. All right, so that's, that's basically how we use the post-processing stack. And as you can see, it's a lot of tweaking and getting these values right. So it actually takes a bit before we actually get to a scene we want. And it's gonna be different for every, for every scene that you want to make. Um, but it's, it's an amazing tool and I would suggest, if, especially if you're making 3D, 3D games, start using it, start playing around with it. Um, it does a lot. One of the other things we, we use, which we found in the Atom demo, is tube lights. And they actually also play a big role in our game. Um, um, just to mention, this, these tube lights are for the, from the volumetric light pad that they oh. showed yesterday from the, on the keynote. Okay, there you go. See, what do I know? Um, but as you can see, we, we actually get a lot of specular lightning on the, on the racetrack from these, uh, from these tube lights. So they, they really like give or add to the atmosphere of the game. Um, we also started using um, Timeline in our game. And one of the things we use it for is, for instance, we have some of the traps, and one of the traps is a door. And that door is actually just on a timeline. So we use Timeline to, to open or close that door. Um, and we also use Cinemachine. And we're actually glad that we now have Cinemachine because uh, one of the things that we had to do is we wanted to have an intro sequence. We always said, let's make an intro sequence. And the thing is, we would know that me or Peter, our other programmer, would have to like code something to make the camera go, you know, where we want it to go. And with Cinemachine, that's all gone. I mean, we just let the artist do that, right? <laughs> See, my job is easy. <laughs> so I hope there's more tools coming, so I don't have to write any more code, and everything can be done by him. Um, so maybe uh, you can show, like, how this works in our game. So every scene has an intro sequence, which will hopefully fire up. All right. So what we do here basically is just blending between two virtual cameras to make these subtle movements. And there you go. All right. Okay, so that's, that's basically why we are happy that, that we have now this timeline and cinema machine thing because it makes, it makes life very easy for us to create things like these. Um, one of the other parts that's very important for us is data and analytics. Um, we also 
want to capture and want to know what people are actually doing in our game and what levels they are playing and what levels, more importantly, they are not playing. Okay, because these are levels that probably are not fun and that might need some tweaking. So even in the demo version that we have up on GameJolt, we, we have um, some of these analytics uh, ready so we can actually see what's, what's happening. And even cool stuff, like one of the things we can see is like who's playing single player, who's playing split screen with two people, split screen with three people, split screen with four people. Like all of these things, all of this data can be gathered from Unity. So I would also suggest if you're making a game, the more data you get on what your players are doing, uh, the better for you. Um, there are also some other assets that we use. Um, one of them is TextMesh Pro. Uh, the guys that have been to the training day uh, might have seen it. So Unity has its own text system. They now acquire TextMesh Pro, which was a, an asset in the store. They actually bought the company or, or at least the tool. And they're going to work it into the, uh, to the editor even more, as I understand. Um, but the good thing about it uh, is that, for instance, in our, uh, in our opening scene, uh, we have this menu, right? And at the moment, these are still images. But what happens when you're doing localization, right? Then you need to replace all of these images, which is a bit harder than replacing text. And TextMesh Pro actually allows us to create the same image, the same um, yeah, visual, uh, but, but without using an actual image, but actually using text. So it's easy to change and so on. So if you haven't yet, take a look at TextMesh Pro. Um, there's a, a whole host of settings you can play around with and you can definitely do a lot with it. Some of the other asset store tools in our game I want to mention. Um, because, you know, why, why would you write code or why would you invent something that somebody else has already done? So the asset store is actually a good place for finding these things. Now, one of the things we use is ShaderForge. Right, to create the shaders in our game. And again, it's so that I don't have to write uh, HLSL code. I can just make, have Subi make shaders using Shader 4. So again, you know, the less I have to do, the happier I am. Uh, so that's what he does. Now, we also use a spline system, something that Unity does not have standard, but we found a very good one, Dreamtech splines. What it allows us to do is it allows us to extrude uh, a mesh along the track. So we actually can, can easily build and tweak our track in the beginning because we can just like move the spline and it will automatically change the track, right? It also allows us to, play, to place objects in the game uh, according to the track. So if we want walls, you know, we can also use the spline tool to place the walls. Um, another tool we use is rewired. Maybe some of you used it before. Uh, we like to play the game with controllers. And Rewired is really a good option for controller support. They support like a, v a very big array of them. The fog volume, fog volume three, is also something we use to give some more atmosphere in the game. I guess, yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Right. Um, Aquas is a tool we use to make our water look a bit more, more realistic. Um, you haven't seen any of that yet, but there are some levels coming that will have uh, water in them. And Decalicious is a tool we use to place decals um, on, on some of our buildings. So those are basically the, the most important tools we use from the, uh, from the asset store. I just wanted to mention them if you're looking for tools like that. I mean, the asset store is big, and there's a lot of good stuff out there. So coming to the end of my talk, if you want to know more about our game, you can find us on twi Twitter, on Facebook. We have a web page. Uh, we have a playable demo that's on Game Jolt, which we are going to update soon. Um, so yeah, if you still have any questions for me, feel free. There are two mics, so if you do have questions, I'd be glad to answer them. All right. Hi. Hi. <coughs> Thanks. That was, Hi. that was a great talk. Very informative. Um, just wondering what you're running into going to PS4. Um, it, it sounded like you were a little tentative about that port. Um, yeah, because it, it basically comes down to not having too much experience in it at the moment. Um, we know we have to go through a certification process. 
uh, which is the same with, with Xbox. You also have to go through a certification process. And it, it actually takes a while bec before you can, you, you can go to it. The thing is, um, we recently signed with a publisher, and he has asked us to uh, maybe also do a PS4 release at the same time. Uh, it, it actually comes down to you know finding the right people who can help us with that and, and then maybe make it go smooth. But it was not our, our original idea. Our original idea was Xbox because Xbox doesn't really have like a flagship game in this genre at the moment, so that's why we chose uh, that platform first. Cool, thank you. All right. Uh, so you guys mentioned you're using Timeline and Cinemachine for your cameras. Was that in place even when you started the project or did you? Did you add it halfway through? What was the process for like, or how was adding it if you did do that, if you did add it halfway? Yeah, we added it halfway and it was really easy. If you want, I can quickly show how easy it is. So we have this timeline here and what we do is we have a bunch of, uh, I'm sorry, a bunch of cameras, you see, and uh, as I go through the timeline, it's just blending between those positions. So if I grab this camera, and uh, uh, hold on. I move it a bit further, and you can see that it's updating. So if I move this here, then it's already going to another place. If I rotate it, it's blending there. So it's really easy. And it's really fast to iterate, so it's perfect for us. It Thank you. only took us two weeks, I think, to implement this whole beginning uh, sequence from zero to what we have now on all the levels. So yeah. it was pretty fast. That's cool. Thank you. All right. Hi. You mentioned localization. Are, you, mm -hmm. are there any assets or anything that you're using to help you manage that process? Uh, in addition to, like what you mentioned with text message program? Um, not at the moment, to be honest. Um, it, it's not something we have been working on right now, so, but thanks for telling me this, this so I know now that we'll probably run into yeah, problems into with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I'm aware of it, but we haven't really started with it, so, okay. Hi. Hi. Um, you're building your game on next-gen consoles, so I'm guessing maybe this has never been an issue, but have you guys run into any performance issues? Um, uh, yeah, performance is always always an issue. So um, what we do is we, we have a couple of older machines on which we try to run our game, uh, like older PCs, I mean. And we, we actually try to keep an eye on how new levels are doing because we also see that there is a lot of performance difference between the levels we build. Um, so it's, it's looking at the performance monitor and, and seeing like where, where, where are things um, going wrong and, and what do we need to, to tweak them and, and get them in the, in, the right, uh, in the right size? But yeah, that's, that's more of the data analytics and, and iterating and, and looking at solutions. Uh, I, I know Subi uh, mentioned the screen space reflections. We started actually using that and we saw that it increased the load enormously. And it didn't, I mean, it adds a lot, but if you're going fast, you don't even notice it. So that's why we turned it off. But these are things you know, we, we constantly look for and cons are constantly tweaking. For the timeline, do you guys use it for anything else, or is it just for the intros? We do use it for some shaders, yeah. So we animate some shaders with it. But I think you're gonna use it more now. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Because he can do it, and I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier for both of us. So. Hey, uh, downsides, upsides for using Collab or any team uh, configuration system. Um, well. The, well, the upsides are definitely that it's built into the engine. So that, that for us makes it, makes it easy to use. It's easy for our artists to use as well because they don't have to think about uh, having to go into another program and, and, and doing all those things. Um, the downsides are there's no branching, for instance, at the moment in Colab, as far as I know. So um, that might be one of the downsides if you're looking to, to branch your production version with, with like a development version. Um, so, but basically, we, we, are, we are really happy with it. I, I'm sure that there are more advanced programs out there that do a lot more than, than what Colab does. But for a small team of four people, I mean, that's all we need at the moment. Since you're focused on uh, Xbox development and PC, 
I was just curious if you guys are doing anything for Xbox One X and changing any behavior or special effects or anything. Well, the thing is, we, we actually develop uh, our game as well for 4K uh, on the PC. So we're currently we're, we're, we're in the works of, of testing that. Um, what we need to, some of the things we need to take care of is like how menus look and, what, uh, and whatnot. Um, so that's, that's something to definitely look into. Uh, but basically, other than that, it's, it's kind of easy going from like 1080p to, to 4K. Um, we, have, we don't have a dev kit for, uh, for the 1X yet, but uh, since Microsoft is here in the expo, we've been talking to them, and uh, we'll, we'll see about getting those. And they've, they've told us if you get it running normally on, on the normal 1X, uh, sorry, the, the 1S, then the 1X is not a problem to, uh, to have it run there as long you know, as your textures are, are ready and everything. So, but basically, we're not too worried about, about that. Okay, guys, I see my time is, uh, is up at the moment. Um, we do have a booth downstairs in the expo. We're showing the game there. If you want to come and play, feel free. If you want to ask more, ex uh, more questions, feel free as well. We're there. So thank you. Thanks.